Are you ready to take your screenwriting career to the next level? If you're a new or aspiring screenwriter who feels lost or stuck in your career, the Working Writer School is here to teach you what writing courses don't. Former student Dylan Evans said, There are a ton of writing classes out there, but this course helped me work through the stuff that I couldn't find anywhere else. I feel more prepared and more knowledgeable to take on the next phase of my writing career. Writer Nicole Bennett said, After taking this course, I have a clear framework for the mindset, productivity, networking, and financial management skills needed for longevity in this industry. And Jay Burlingham calls this course the map. This course has given me a map that I will return to again and again as I move forward in my career as a writer. Use code MMIH for 10% off from now until January 31st and go to theworkingwriter.com. That's theworking, W-E-R-K-I-N-G, writer.com to sign up today. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome. This is the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Mark Bissell, the founding host of the podcast, and I'm a sci-fi horror filmmaker, and my first feature film, The Alternate, is out now on digital and DVD. Woo! I'm Liz Manischel. I'm a writer, director, producer who has made two features, Bread and Butter and Speed of Life, and I'm currently in pre-production on my third Best Friends Forever. I'm a distribution consultant who does sales, and I used to manage Sundance's creative distribution initiative. This week, we welcome director Orshi Najipal, who talks about meeting Dean Devlin from, oh my gosh, from like every movie from the 90s. She talks about getting hired to direct The Deal and what it was like to make that movie. After that, we play another round of The Game. Not as good as Alric when he does it. Mm-hmm. And we have another question for The Game from listener Colin Stryker. But first, Alric, how are you? I'm okay. Last week was a really busy week for me, work-wise, as is every week, it seems. Except this week seems like it's going to be less busy, which is good. Yeah, I, I think I talked about my uh, the movie I'm attached to as a director, like having casting you know, ups and downs. And, you know, I feel like I'm just being overly dramatic because, you know, we've only been casting for like maybe a month and, you know, to not have the movie casted in a month is like absolutely normal and you never get your first ask anyways. So we're, we're just keeping trucking. We had a really great call with the executive producer on Friday where, (laughs) so I don't know if the writer listens to this show, but he's a great guy. I love this guy so much. We've been working really closely together on this project since it happens. We like text every day or more than every, like all the time about the movie. And he's been like really discouraged by how long it's taking for this to all come together. And he like wants us to be acting faster. And he's like, just worried and wants to know and blah, blah, blah. And I feel like I've been like, dude, like this is fast, man. Like I've everything I've been a part of, like nothing goes as fast as this has gone. And so we had this really great meeting with the, with the EP where he basically was just like, look guys, like I know this isn't what we wanted, like what we were talking about as far as our trajectory trajectory goes. Like they, they had all, we kind of planned to be further ahead by this point. Like we kind of felt that at AFM, we would have gotten our deal put together, which was like, I think maybe just overly enthusiastic or overly ambitious uh, on all of our parts to think that. But he was like, look, I'm committed to making this movie. We're going to make it one way or another. Like we're either going to make it at X level with the, with bigger name talent, or we're going to make it at this level with like lesser big name talent, you know? So just whatever. Don't worry. <laughs> like we're, we're moving this forward. We're not giving up. Like I got a plan. This is the plan. We're going to execute this plan. Just, you know, bear with me here, you know, and this guy's, he made three movies that came out all in 20 and 2020 and 2021, kind of all following the same process. So like, I definitely believe that yeah. this guy can do it, you know, but like, I just, it's funny when like you're, you're talking to like the, the more neurotic, you know, impatient personality that we all have inside of us, you know, as creators, but that's like coming to the forefront in this one creative person. It's hard to not like start to think like, yeah, well, why is it taking this long? Why don't we have this person? Why did they say no? Why isn't this happening? Why aren't we doing this? It's like, you know, but you, you got to just pull back from that and be like, look, this is the process. It's all good. Like, you know, well, this movie will happen or it won't happen. And if it doesn't happen, that's not the end of the world either. But like, I just sort of kind of had this new found chill, chillness towards the, the process and just trust the process that this guy's following. And 
it'll work out. But like now I think with that trust and chill, like with this project, it means I got to take my energy and put it into like whatever other project I have going on. Yeah. You know, so I can actually p- push something forward because there's nothing really for me to do on the other one. I'm just waiting, chiming in when names are told to me. And I'm like, yeah, that person's great. Let's work with that person. <laughs> Make an offer or a contingent offer. Go ahead. Let's do it. But yeah, I really want to start writing again. So I mean, I, I don't think it's going to happen like this week or maybe not even next week. But I, I don't know. After talking to Saeed, who we, we had a call with on... on Saeed Crumpler? Saeed Crumpler, the man who's amazing. I met him at AFF. We had a great conversation. And like I immediately knew that he had to be on the show because of the things he was telling me <laughs> at this bar. But yeah, it was really cool. And, and his whole thing where he was like, yeah, I took off two days of work to write every week. And that's how I got my writing done. Like I just rearranged my schedule in my life to make the writing happen. Well, I can't quit my job for two days a week. Like I have to work full time at my job in order to keep the job I have. But like I can block out an hour, you know, here or there, or even 30 minutes a day probably to write and just be, you know, more, you know, more regimented in my writing, you know? And and like what he said, another lovely thing. He's like, if you're not going to, like, don't get beat yourself up if you're sitting in front of the desk and nothing comes out. Like, you got to the desk, you got to your place where you're supposed to write. If oh, nothing yeah. happens, it's like, don't, you don't be upset. And I feel like sometimes if I, if I sit down to write and nothing happens, I get upset. And I think, you know, going back to writing, I think I need to like, just embrace that part of it. And if 30 minutes isn't long enough, then do one hour, three times a week, you know, instead of 30 minutes a day or an hour and a half two times a week or whatever it is, like just figure out whatever process I need to write and do it because I, I know I can write things. I have done it and I do do it, but I feel like I need to come up with some sort of plan in order for it to work. That's what I want to spend the next like part of the end of the year working on. It's coming up with my writing plan and then start executing it. But how are you, Liz? What are you up to? Well, going back to what you said, I mean, I used to do 20 minutes a day and it wasn't 20 minutes of writing. It was 20 minutes of sitting in front of Celtics and seeing if I could write. And I totally agree with what Saeed said, which is like, it's not about the pr- the pages you produce. It's about just giving yourself those 20 minutes to try to see if something comes out, right? It's like giving yourself the opportunity. So I'm so on board with that. I wanted to go back to what you said about the, the establishment film you're attached to, right? That's how I see it. Like the establishment and then like the lack yeah. of establishment. And <laughs> yeah, I found out, I think maybe... Maybe like six months ago, four to six, six months ago, that my role on that film that I'm attached to, that's my establish- establishment film, is to only say no when I really have to say no. And at this point where we're still fundraising and the whole point of our film that we all agree to do is pre-sales fundraising. So it's very cast dependent. So it's like my only job is to like draw the line when I have to draw the line. So like they'll send me a list of actors and like 80% of this list I would never put on a like list of actors I really want to work with or actors mm. that I think are super talented or whatever. But if there's someone on there that I'm like is absolutely wrong, then I draw the line. And I say, you know, my job is to make is to say no very rarely in fundraising. And it, I know that's so depressing. And I feel like I could hear people be like, that's not a director. That's not an artist. And it's like, that's not what we're doing with this film. When we're on set, when we're building the shot list, when we're storyboarding, all those things, it's like, that's when we get to impose our creativity. But like right now, the state of indie film is to say yes when you don't want to say yes <laughs> to get the green light. Like we had this conversation, you know, there's this actor that we're out to right now and it's not Mel Gibson, but <laughs> there's a rumor that this person is anti-Semitic, this person that we're out to. And I was on a text chain with me and two of my producers and the two producers were like, we are not working with an anti-Semi, like uh, we draw the line. And I was there sitting like, well, what did they do? Like, how anti-Semitic were they? Like, that's how dire the state of financing independent films is. Where I'm like, and we are all Jewish, by the way, all three people on the text chain were Jewish. We're like making these negotiations with ourselves. Wow, I'm going to get in trouble for that in probably about three (laughs) years. So, 
someone's going to come back and pull that out. Well, I, yeah, I just, for the record, I don't think it's anything wrong with like trying to question like, oh, well, are they actually anti-Semitic? Yeah, that is what I was doing. Yeah. Like, I think like that's the question because I feel like a lot of people say things, especially on the internet, like people just like jump to these crazy conclusions and right. it's like, mm, that's not really what they meant or that's not really what they said. Or it's like in James Gunn's case, like that's clearly a joke. Like he doesn't actually want to kill babies or whatever, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I feel like I always want to do my own research and my own, you know, kind of like find out like what's the truth in this rumor, you know, or is there truth in this rumor, you know? Right. I I used it to prove like a ridiculous, you know, it's like a I used it as a joke almost to be like things are so dire. But I do agree with you 100 percent that like we can't make major decisions based off of hearsay, like especially if it's three degrees away from us or four degrees away from us, if it's something that we didn't experience ourselves and we don't know what has substantiated that rumor in any way. What I wanted to mention on the show briefly is I've been meeting with my producers for my film, Best Friends Forever. And one of them asked me to write my film utopia, to put down on paper exactly what would be a utopia? What is my ideal circumstance? And she was like, and then we'll do our best to execute that. And it was so exciting. No one had ever asked me. what an ideal situation would be is, and no one ever offered to execute it before, right? So I spend the past few days drawing up a film utopia, which is only three pages right now, which is excessive, I'm aware. But it was very fun to think like, what could be? And a lot of them were things that studio films get access to, like access to the location, editorial on set, test screenings, <laughs> all <laughs> merch. Well, what else? Fair rates for grill, bringing in designers early, walkthroughs, mini scouts, not just one or two scouts, mini scouts. Like they're all things that I think studio films all have. It's not anti-studio, but they're all things that I've never had. And then there's some more radical ideas. But I just think it's funny. I was telling Sean, I was like, here's my idea, here's my idea. And he's like, well, a lot of films already do that. You just have never done that. So it's like, what's radical to you? And what would be a utopia to you? More time, more resources, right? Yeah. I think more time is like the thing that that everybody wants and no one gets, you know, except when you actually have money. So I I liked what the, 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 the Nelms brothers said, that like they would rather have more time over anything else in in the world right and i've been thinking about that while building my test budgets for this movie that i'm attached to it's like well they told me that i could only have 20 days but what if i could use the budget and get 22 days like would they be okay with that you know like could i do that you know but i think a lot of a lot of the problem is it's like the cast we can only have for so many days too you know and whatever so it's all tough but yeah, I've been thinking about like trying to push, like if I'm going to push for something, you know, push for more days and take a smaller crew or take whatever, take away the jib. I don't know. Whatever it is, just like it's make more the time. Sacrifice. It's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah I agree. But what also is a really important thing is our Patreon campaign. Don't forget to support us on Patreon. www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast. We want to wish happy, happy birthday to Chris Scott, who's a new Patreon backer. We really appreciate all your support, Chris. We wish you happy birthday because we don't know your actual birthday, but we want to celebrate you for donating to the Patreon. So happy birthday, Chris. You know, you'll hear it from us a lot, but the Patreon, you know, we don't always have guaranteed sponsorship. We don't always have a way of making money in the show, but the Patreon is the way that you can directly support the show. And Ulrich is actually putting the majority of episodes behind the Patreon paywall now in the way that it's even more dramatic than it was before. So you will have access, which I'm sure you'll hear in the little plug in that we we play in like two minutes. (laughs) But just an acknowledgement that it really will benefit us. But also don't forget to check out our sponsor for right now, Jambox.io, which is a new royalty-free music and SFX company with an emphasis on high-quality cinematic cues. Their composers have worked on soundtracks for Hollywood-level films, working with directors like Michael Bay, Martin Scorsese, or global brands like DJI. They offer customized plans to fit your needs. Check them out, Jambox.io. But without any more delay, here's our chat with Orshi.
Orshi, can you give us the elevator pitch for the deal? Mm, yeah, although I never had to do the elevator pitch for this film. So the deal is a dystopian drama set in the near future where resources are so scarce that a dictatorship kind of government is offering you a deal. You can get 20 years of relatively good life, but then you have to take your own life. So you don't use too much resources. This film is about a mother who's trying to save her daughter from such a future. So we are we are we are witnessing their escape, that, that they attempt to escape this regime. And how many days did you shoot the film? I think we shot it for 30 days and maybe two or three more days additionally maybe two more days additionally that was a long time ago what can you speak of with regard to the budget that's a very good question i don't know what i am allowed to say this is a low budget production which looks bigger than what the budget would suggest but dean devlin the producer of the film decided to bring this film to serbia where everything is much much cheaper than the us and it's even cheaper than Europe, the rest of Europe. They were always telling me that everybody feels that the money is worth three times more than what you would wow. imagine in, that you would get in the US as in value because locations are cheaper, accommodation, food and crew is cheaper, much cheaper than in the US. Yeah, we, we don't have to press. We're just trying because a lot of emerging filmmakers listen to the show and they have no sense of like what you can make a movie for. So I mean, if there's any way to share, like, is it under a million like that? Even that data is helpful. It's above. Okay. See, that's that's helpful to hear. And then it sounds like you didn't necessarily come up with the idea, but how did you get involved in the, the film? I guess we could say that I was at the right th- time at the right place, kind of. And this film, the, the idea stems from Sumali Montano, who is the producer and the lead actress in the film. She plays the mother. That was her story. She came up with uh, the idea because she wanted to make a film about how too late in her life she realized how grateful she is to her mother who who sacrificed so much for her daughter, so to Somali. And when her mother passed away, she wanted to write and, and, and make a film dedicated to her mom. So the film is dedicated to Somali's mom. So she found a writer who was a friend of hers of a long time, Sean Trezant, who was busy in the industry and in L.A., they wrote a first script and then she met the producer Dean Devlin, who is famous for Stargate and Independence Day and Godzilla and stuff like that, who got hooked because he liked the script, he liked the idea of the world and who happened to be shooting a TV series in Serbia, a fantasy TV show called The Outpost. And he had very, very good experience with shooting with local crew, with Serbian crew in Serbian studios. Now that, that uh, everything is much cheaper, but the quality is good. And this is where I came into the picture because I was recommended to direct a few episodes in that TV show Mm. by Common Friends. So I ended up directing a few episodes in The Outpost in uh, season two and then three and then four. And and I think this was at season, this was my first time. And Dean was coming to visit the set and he was already prepping the deal and they were looking for a director and I was there. And they sent me the script. They asked for my very honest opinion. And I had no idea that I could be seriously considered because I thought that they want someone more experienced or American or I don't know. But I just I just thought that I'm just gonna give my very honest opinion, come what may. And I and I and I bold a very I wrote a very bold <laughs> email about what I love about the script and what where I think the script needs some work on what references come to mind, what visuals come to mind. And 24 hours later, I received an email, them requesting all my work from before I had I have directed short films that were doing some awards and uh, a lot of TV and drama, comedy, satire. And I had my fe- I, I had a feature film, which was a romantic comedy dramedy about a couple opening up their relationship. So it's a completely different topic. And I could send that to them, to Dean and the other producers. Within 24 hours, another 24 hours, I received an email with the subject, capital letters, your movie is amazing. <laughs> And that was that was pretty cool to wake up one day because you know because of the LA time difference. So when it's their day, it's my night. So when I wake up, I receive all the emails from Los Angeles, and uh, waking up an email like Dean Devlin says, "Your movie is amazing." 
uh, let's talk. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, whoa, now, now we are, now it's getting interesting. So I said, sure, let's talk. Uh, in 24 hours, we set up a, a Zoom meeting and I'm expecting to have a friendly chit chat with Dean, whom I met when he was in Serbia for a dinner. So I, I thought, you know, it's going to be very casual. So I was like at home, whatever, start, starting the Zoom call and I, and, I, and I open it and there's this massive meeting room, huge table. 15 people in the room, including Somali, the, including the writer, including some five other producers. I didn't even know who's who. They were all looking at me and they were staring at me. And I was, as I found out later, I was in a gigantic screen. <laughs> and I only saw, I only saw very tiny dots, you know, because when you have a, in Zoom, when you have the, on the other side, one gigantic room, it's a big wide shot of small people. So that's what, that was it. And then I was like, oh, wow, that's surprising what, what's going on. And then they spent the first 15 minutes telling me what they loved about my feature film, which scenes and why. So they really watched it. And then they spent another 15 minutes explaining to me all the emotional background of the, the, the deal, where it comes from. And then the next hour was discussing suggestions, ideas, how to proceed if. And then within a few days, I got, I got the offer. I was, they proposed and I said yes. <laughs> When was that? So, like, we're we're also trying to build a timeline while we hear your story. So, the the timeline was yeah. crazy. Yeah, like I mean, there's a reason why I mentioned and within 24 hours and within 24 hours, like yeah. that. This is basically what what then kept on happening the whole time. Everything was happening super fast. This, like, I met Dean in 2019 February. He sent me the the script. March, April, the first of May, I was already in in London doing casting sessions. Wow! Wow! So that's that's the speed. So I think I think probably April was spent on negotiations and figuring out things, and then as soon as that was done, I I, I remember I was I was in a DIY store because I was just moving into my new apartment and I had a lot of work to do, and I was just in the DIY <laughs> store checking out all kinds of taps. And, and like bathroom things in my head and I was carrying stuff and I get a phone call and I'm like, oh, I'm like, hey, can you, can you hop on a plane now? And then I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the next morning I hopped on a plane and then I had uh, a few days of casting sessions in London. And then from then on, I, I, I flew to Belgrade and May and June was pre-production. Very, very short, very short pre-production, five or six weeks, five weeks, like nothing and then six weeks of shoot in the hottest month which is july august crazy hot hot in belgrade and then we were editing end of august september in budapest my hometown because i'm hungarian and then from october on we moved everything to los angeles where dean the producer is based then i was in los angeles for october november editing in december we managed to shoot a few more extra days back in belgrade and then i was supposed to go back to Los Angeles to continue, but it 2020 started and everything stopped and everything was like falling apart. And nobody knew what's going on. And we were there with a the half finished film and people couldn't work. People were panicking. So 2020 was like gone and all our big plans and, and hopes for <laughs> finishing this film super fast <laughs> and, and launching it to the audience. So we were very, very fast in the beginning and then slowed down significantly due to COVID. And basically the film was finished a few months ago and we had a premiere now in the, at the Trieste Science Fiction Film Festival a week ago. And then compared to all the other projects you've made, how difficult was this one? Well, well it, was, it was very, very difficult, but it's difficult to compare because every project is very, very different. Like here, a lot of the difficulties came from from the fact that we had to be so fast that everything had to happen really fast. Decisions were made super fast. Like the script was still heavily getting rewritten while we were already shooting it, oh. which caused issues that we then had to solve in post as you do. So there were a lot of complications because of this, because of the pacing of the production. But on the other hand, it was also very good. Like I worked with other project projects where you have a very long process and still face a lot of issues. <laughs> 
and it also drags for a long time, you know. So I don't know. It's 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 hard to say. But was it difficult? It was yes. It was terribly difficult. <laughs> it was it was a hell of a ride. It was it was a big challenge. The script was being rewritten. The, the 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 heat was unbearable. Like this is partly. I mean, that's why we changed the, in the original concept. This future wasn't this hot, <laughs> but because but because we. We were in this super hot place, and we were like, "Okay, that let's." And and you know, in August, in 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 long, long, uh, long days with a lot of sunshine, where the, we have a lot of hours where the sun shines from above, directly from above. It's, so it's it's something that usually you don't want to shoot then, because it's not the nicest. But then my DP Matt, they had boy, he was an amazing DP. Decided let's let's use this as a as a tool. Let's make this world look super hot and dry so that's that's how it ended up looking like that in the beginning i'm i'm putting myself in your place by the way Ulrich and i are both feature filmmakers and we both have made sci-fi features as our last project so it's just always interesting when we talk to another person <laughs> in the genre i'm putting myself in your place i'm thinking and by the way my first feature was a rom-com just so uh <laughs> similar, in, in a weird there way you, go. you get this offer you've made one feature You know that this guy, Dean Devlin, is known for like massive tentpole films. You know that they're on a really fast timeline. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you have reps because you worked in the advertising world and the TV world, but you tell me if I'm wrong. You had a lot of power in that moment is what I'm acknowledging. Like you had the... You could negotiate, you could slow things down, you could say, I need a larger fee, you know, like there was a world where you had a lot of power because they were super excited to get you on board and to steamroll the production. Can you talk a little bit about negotiating and kind of advocating your, for yourself in a situation like that? I didn't have a rep back okay. then because in Eastern Europe, nobody has one. We don't have this system at all because we are so few people that everybody knows everyone. So if you need to negotiate, most of the time directors negotiate for themselves. So many times your fee depends on are you a good salesperson? Are you a good businesswoman? Or you're a good director? Or you happen to be both? I had experience in uh, in making my own deals because of the TV jobs that I got. But I wouldn't say that I was in a powerful position or at least I didn't see it as much as a powerful, powerful position. I mean, I think it's it's for me, it's more like until the moment where I think, oh my God, this can't be real. This is so, this is too good to be true. Until then, I'm like very like, well, I want this and I want that and I can, (laughs) and this is what I think about the script and, you know, (laughs) and I really need to change this and that. And then when it gets like, okay, you have it, you have it now, we give it to you, but now you fucking push it through. And then I'm like, oh, hmm, okay. <laughs> then I'm just in the work mode. Then I'm not anymore in negotiation mode. So, but I think I was fine. I mean, I I I, I took some good advice from from friends in the business, and uh, I think it went okay. So, just to push on that a little bit more, when you got your offer, did you counter or did you just accept before? No, you you never accept. <laughs> oh, never. I mean, that's. <laughs> Listen, I okay. I, I used to work as a producer in commercials uh, in my previous life uh, for a few years. And what I've learned there, the basic rule, and I think it's true for everyone, is that you never, ever accept the first offer. Never. Because when you get an offer, the person who gives you, if they are a professional, and these guys are professionals, if they give you an offer, they already calculate, they have it in mind that you're not going to accept it, but you're going to ask for a certain percentage more. So here comes the dance. How much is the more? So, of course, I didn't know. I, I didn't accept it. Not because it was a horrible offer, but because that's I've already learned that you never accept the first offer. Even if it's just going to be a little bit of raise, still, like... I don't know. That's how the business goes. And I think it's true for not only in commercials, but also in TV and also in films. Probably also in every other place. Okay. And the next question I had, which was more about working, like how the production came to be, because you, you shot in Siberia, but or Serbia, how much crew was American and how much was local? Like, was there any American crew or was it 100% local crew? It, there was no American crew. Oh, wow. Dean asked me if I want to take an American DP that he was recommending, or if I prefer to work with my own DP that I work the most. I was lucky because he really liked my feature film and he really liked my, some of my previous work, which I've done most of my 
my previous work with Mate Herbai. And I, that was also with, we were very lucky because Mate was just, he got the Camera Image Award the year before for the film on Body and Soul, which was Oscar nominated for Best International Film. So his name was hot. He, he I think he was, was he nominated for an American Cinematographer Award or he, maybe he won it? I don't know, but it, it, he was hot. And he's a good friend of mine, and we worked a lot together. So it was a uh, it was an easy choice for everybody, and he was available. So we in on in May, like two weeks after I arrived, he arrived to the production, and then he had to bring his gaffer from Hungary because there was no more gaffer in Serbia left. Serbia has amazing crew, but very very few crews. So if you have a big other big project uh, project going on, then you're not going to have enough people. So. We had to bring the gaffer and I ended up bringing a first AD from Hungary as well because nobody was available in Serbia. But otherwise, everybody was, all the HODs were Serbians. All the producers were Americans, of course. And the post -produ in post-production, we started the, the editing here in Budapest. So I took my Hungarian editor into the Hungarian editing suite. But then the whole thing moved to LA. Then we got Dean's editor, Brian, who's a great guy. And then we ended up using an American composer as well. And so for post-production, everybody was, after a while, everybody was American because the film was finished in Los Angeles. But the crew, the crew was Serbian. I knew many of them because of the TV shows that I shot there, but not all of them. I want to talk a little bit about the emotional experience of what I think may have been. I don't know the budget level of your first feature, and I know you're a quite prolific director in TV, but it still feels like the way you're telling the story, it was a leveling up of budget, possibly, and resources. Uh, could you talk a little bit about maybe the intimidating or scary aspects of that and how you overcame that? Or, or maybe you weren't in any way scared? scared or intimidated very simple i had no time to be scared <laughs> i was casting on first of may and i started shooting end of june or what was it beginning of june yeah end of june or beginning of july there was no time to be scared no time i just had to like push no we didn't get i, I didn't get it i think Everything came much later when I realized, oh my God, <laughs> what's going on? But no, yes, it, it is a bigger budget production that, than uh, what I, my first feature was a low budget rom-com. But I mean, I, the scale, the, the scale difference between the two of them is more about with, with, with the deal, we just needed some special locations and we needed a bit of action. And we moved a lot to these funky locations and factories and all the industrial landscapes that I love and all the block buildings and endless jungle of concrete that you can find in New Belgrade, which I loved. The world building that that was that was a that was a big uh, challenge for me because in my first feature film, that film was uh, here and now, where you don't have to deal with any of that. You only I only had to concentrate. The world was the connection between my lead actors and the relationship that that has a dynamic. That was what I all my concentration was on that. And here, a lot of my attention had to go away from the relationship drama, which is the heart of the the family drama. It's a, it's, it's a real hardcore family drama. It's about a mother and a daughter and a father who never was who never was there. So it's 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 that weird triangle triangle. <laughs> of a relationship but I also had to pay attention to where where this is all playing out and how do you in such a short time because the film is quite short it's only 95 minutes including credits like how do you manage to show a completely different society with different set of rules with a different <clears throat> and it's a complicated world so that was a challenge so I have a couple of questions it's kind of going on the same path that Liz was going with this this fear question like it seems like you had a lot of trust from the producers early on in the process was there any time where like you had to earn that trust once you actually got the job and you were working like in pre-production and then in production or was it kind of like this thing that they kind of bought into your expertise and your ability like in the in the interview process and then once you got the job it was just like oh yeah or she's got it N no worries no one's challenging her she's she knows what the fuck she's doing i don't think anybody ever gets to that to that point i'm pretty sure that there are people who are asking or doubt have doubts about martin scorsese you know like you know, oh my god <laughs> that's gonna work like, it's it's 
the, the, the thing the thing is that I think it's very very difficult to to judge a director's performance because there are a lot of things that don't make any sense until you get to the final stage when you actually see it edited sound mixed with music you know it's like so much of what we are doing is it's difficult to judge I mean what what people what do people judge during pre-production what can they judge you you know what they they look at oh uh, does she look confident or does she like change her mind every day uh, obviously if you keep on changing your mind every day by the way which should be completely normal because you are just figuring things out no you cannot show that you have to show that you are 100 percent confident and you know what you are doing and nobody can nobody can know that inside you are like <laughs> What, what what are we doing you know like when like i said i didn't have time to panic i didn't have time to really be scared that helped I, I, really surprisingly i have to say that that helped uh, you know when you have a really short deadline you don't think that much you just it, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the best possible solution that you come up with but at least you are on the move which sometimes is better than staying in one place hesitant the other thing is that because i had my dp mate who then had his gaffer and i had my ad so we were like the four of us we were the four the four crazy hungarians as they called us in serbia <laughs> <laughs> we were the yeah, the four crazy ones. That's how they called it. So we trusted each other and we, we were leaning on each other. And I think many, many times we were saving each other's butts. Like I, it was very difficult. It was very emotional. There were lots of days when, you know, what we did is that uh, every single evening after the shoot as well, and also after pre-production and all the time, every evening we, we went out together, the four of us, to have a slice of pizza or whatever, and maybe a beer and just talk, <laughs> just just get all the issues out. And after a while, a lot of it was a lot of it was like a therapy session that we did to each other, like ventilating, you know, like somebody was yelled at that day. And then you have to listen to how they feel. And then we have to tell them nice things and you have to hug the person and you have to make sure that, you know, next time somebody yells at you, you're just going to kick ass or something. <laughs> and that was happening. <laughs> That was happening quite a lot. Obviously, there was a lot of conflicts. I mean, if you if you if you push a production to this speed uh, and it's forty degrees in Celsius, which is really lo a lot, you know, people get tense and they are tired. So there were a lot of tension. Then there were tensions, and it was sometimes very difficult to to deal with that. But I think it was because we were there for each other as a unit. We helped each other, so that that was a very important, very important part. I don't, I don't remember what was the question. Uh, how, how do you earn trust of your crew and of the producers, you know, through the process? And it sounds like mm. it seems like it was ongoing, maybe. It was, but it's OK for the for the producers. I think the first step was that email that I wrote about the script, then where I think Dean agreed with a lot of things that I was saying, not necessarily with my suggestions, but 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 agreeing to you know when you have a, a problematic point and you have to find that point and then we did we, we did the, the develop it together so dean came to, to to belgrade as well together with the writer sean so it was dean sean and me and then we were spending a lot of time in the room coming up with scenes coming up with 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 sequences uh, what to change what to and i think that was a very exciting creative process and i think we all respected each other's ideas and then i started location scouting and almost every day what was going on like every day for two weeks i went out for location scouting and at the end of the day i sent a selection of photos of what we found what we think is interesting for this film and what could be there so there was there was there are scenes in this film that were not in the script but because i found the location that i thought was looking really good and i suggested something like hey what about we reimagine something and put it in this kind of a space so every day i i send these photos and everyone was was raving about how cinematic it looks and how amazing and how industrial weird never seen this before what the hell is that that's cool so i think that was also probably gaining some trust then i when i started directing i guess i'm usually have a good relationship with actors and i'm and i'm focusing a lot on acting and usually people in most of my jobs that i have people like how i instruct actors and usually i i get good feedback on that and then this was the same here 
this you could see in the dailies but it, yeah of course it's 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 a it's a, it's a it's you need to make people trust you and i think a lot of it is confidence and yeah and you, you also make alliances i mean in, in my case that was a natural alliance with my dp but sometimes the confidence I've I've learned that from other filmmakers who said, of course, now I won't remember n- any names, but big names, big directors that I that I that I like, who said first time they ever had to work with a big crew and not just with their friends, they were shocked by how it feels to when you say cut and everybody's looking at you, the whole crew <laughs> is looking at you because you need to say cut and we move on or we do it once more <laughs> like cut and then this guy at an interview i really i have to, I have to remember his name is a fucking cool uh, sorry if i'm sure i cannot curse no french, you, you can french, curse you're fine french guy who who directed the the charlie kaufman script the the eternal sunshine one of the best films oh. ever what's his name is that michelle gondry yeah gondry it's michelle gondry so thank you he only, he always worked with his friends guess, uh, a very tight circle of friends in france and then he went to do that film in the US and then he was like shocked by the number of people the num- the, 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 the the amount of everything and everything I read it in an interview and then he said that people were looking at him like so what and then he got scared like I don't know no. and then he had he realized that all you need to do is pretend that you know <laughs> <laughs> because if they see that you don't that they then you lose authority and that's true and i've seen it happen on set with uh, a lot of times i am i'm really trying to to go against this in in my life but i've also seen it with other people other directors on set as soon as they look insecure the crew it's like they just have a sensor for this that's one of the most important thing about a director and then they then, then you lose your authority then they won't take you serious and then they will blame everything on you even those things that is not supposed to be blamed on you but so i realized that it's also another thing when you have a big crew when you're working with a lot of people and then you have producers and everyone you know they're all there at the monitor and if you're not yet martin scorsese so you could say get a fuck out of here nobody can nobody can watch my monitor because that's my monitor and i want to be alone and don't look at me but there are all these people you know <laughs> you need to perform that yes i am a director and i know what i'm doing while i'm watching my monitor you know because they are watching me <laughs> i hate that so like i'm <laughs> i'm trying to push for like it's it's that's a that, that my monitor is a no-go zone for everybody else i can i cannot have people there because it's really annoying but of course there are certain producers that you cannot say hey go away you know like <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna come obviously but dean was fun dean dean is uh he was there for the for the first three days of shoot or four days of shoot and crazy because he's such a filmmaker and like he has it in his uh, how do you say that the, the tips of his finger how do you say that it's like it's in his blood like coming up with shots commenting on rhythm and all that and he just uh he just he just knows this language really well. I wanted to ask a question about I, I feel like we're kind of clustering on the same topics, but it, it's it's in that milieu, but co ownership. I mean, I understand that you, you talked about the politics of diplomacy, right? But it's also you have a lead actress who's also the writer and who's also <laughs> Am I am I correct in this? No, she. The, I think she has the idea. Sorry, she's okay. She right. She came up with the idea and she's helping produce. Right. So it. Well, she 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 started the whole thing. I mean, she right. she's the engine of the of the whole project. Like we always said, like if there's no Somali, there's no film. Yeah. Like 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 she she is the the engine, the heart of of the whole thing for sure. And yeah. did you find, because you're also talking about confidence and faking it, but I also am sensing a desire for collaboration and respect for someone else's ideas coming out of what you're saying. So do you do you have to check in with her? like, Or do you set up the ground rules before you go on set? What is that like? Because if, if, if she is that engine and you're the, I'm trying to think of another analogy, like you're the... I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know mechanics, so uh, I don't. It's hard for me. I'm supposed to be the wheel. Okay, so you're the wheel. I love that. She's the engine. You're the wheel. Are you? 
secretly having like, you know, gestures or winks or eye contact to check in with her? Or did she just hand it over to you and say, it's yours now? She handed that over to Dean. Mm. So for it was, it, they, they had this relationship. She trusted Dean to be the producer of the film and to take like creative producing in his hands. So I was always checking things with Dean. Yeah. And he was smart enough and, and, and professional. So he knew that he has to, to make this very clear because I had to direct Somali as an actress. Right. And I think it was mutual. Like we, 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 we understood and we discussed and, and the way she said it, that she has a producer hat and she has an actress, director's hat. And it was difficult for her to, to deal with this situation. It's a very difficult situation. Plus, it's a very own emotional story. There's a lot of baggage there. But it was Dean who, who agreed with her that from the moment she's on set, she needs to take off the producer's hat and keep on the actor's hat because that's the, the best for the film. Because we need her to be an amazing actor, which is hard enough hard enough as a lead in such a movie it's a difficult it's a complex part and she did a, she did a wonderful job i think but you really need all your strength and you need all your concentration and it's a lot of days it's a lot of scenes it's in the heat so it's like really it's about also managing your energies for all of us but also for the for, for a lead actor so that was the agreement. And she was trying not to get too involved in daily production issues. I think she was getting more involved with all that later on with post-production and in her next project. But collaboration, yeah, it's always a collaboration. I don't think like I'm not a, uh, if I wanted to not collaborate, I would be a painter. <laughs> like my grandfather used to be. It's a wonderful thing. You know, it's great. But I didn't become a painter. I, be, I, I, I was first drawn towards uh, theater. I was acting and directing on stage uh, as a kid. And I just loved the collaboration aspect of it. The fact that you put a bunch of people together. And if you, and if you do it on, in, in, in festivals and workshops, it works as well. You put a bunch of strangers together in a room and they have, they have to create a scene, let's say. And just because they all love theater or film, they will, they will just open up and they will, they will collaborate naturally. And, 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 I, and, I, and I think it's such a beautiful human thing to do. That, that's that's the, one of the biggest thrills, I think. If, if you manage to work with really good people, because, you know, you're always going to have trouble, trouble, problems, issues not enough money, not enough time. Oh, weather is not right. Oh, we lost the location. Oh, the location is, uh, we are kicked out, blah, blah, blah. You always have issues. But when you have these moments with, with the people of, oh my God, we are creating together together something because we love this art form, those moments compensate for a lot of headaches and sleepless nights. So let's just recognize really quick that like Dean Devlin, producer of Stargate, Independence Day, these movies and many, many more that are like just like huge milestones in science fiction filmmaking, you know, bottom, bottom line. You can get a chance to work with this guy on a, on a movie. Like, it's like a dream come true. So what I'm wondering is, after the fact, after it's all done, like, how has this changed your career? Or has it changed your career? Like, have, did you now have American agents or managers? Has your career changed at all from making the deal? Yes. It's crazy because I met Dean, although I knew his films. But when I met him while I was shooting The Outpost, I met him as the producer of that show, discussing those scenes that I was shooting and then having dinner and then in a much smaller scale. And I met Dean, the human being, not Dean, the iconic, you know, changed history of film, blah, blah, <laughs> producer. I, I met a super nice guy who's extremely smart, intelligent, cultured, and knows films in and out and inside out. And he just, he's like, like, like there's so much you can learn from him. So that was my impression. And then he makes decisions really fast. And then he's such a pro. And then I don't know when he sleeps. And then he's so enthusiastic about all this. And that's, that's the Dean that I met. So I still can't imagine that this is the same guy who, who did it independent Independence Day. Like, I'm like, I can't, I can't put it in my head. Like, wow, <laughs> that I know that guy. I worked with that guy. Crazy. Of course, uh, uh, I mean, I, I was trying to, to, to move my career, obviously. And I... I was nagging him to, to set me up with agents <laughs> in Los, in, when I was in LA. 
I nagged him every single day until he had enough. And then he just hooked me up with someone. And then I had an agent and a manager. <laughs> but then wow. COVID hit, so nothing happened. But now we do, like I have the relationship. They're trying to get me jobs. It's just that I, I got hired again by Dean to do his new show, The Arc. Well, I went back to The Outpost, so I could continue that. Then I was hired for the new science fiction show that he just wrote and produced, The Arc, which is coming out next year. And then I am right now working on a massive TV series in, in here in Europe that has nothing to do with Dean, but for sure my CV was, was a big part of me getting this job. It's a 15th century epic war, hero, battle, heavy family drama, historic craziness, <laughs> horses and stunts and armor and castles and forts and backlots and everything. And <laughs> Yeah, so I'm shooting that now. Wow. Sounds wonderful. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. We have just a few minutes left and we have six questions we like to ask everyone. So I think we okay. could try to do this as like a rapid fire round, right? What's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? First film that I ever made was uh, I studied at the London Film School where they have the really good system that everybody has to win. In the first year, everybody has to do a short film first. Uh, we rotate. You have to write one, direct one, DP one, camera operate one sound do the sound one and edit one so you make six with six people and you rotate which is a crazy good idea and i recommend it to i would recommend it to every film school so that was the first one how i feel about it i'm proud of it i think it was very ambitious i had no idea <laughs> that i cannot shoot this much in one day <laughs> it was a one day 16 millimeter color no sound film it which we had to edit in 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 celluloid and then later on had dig digital sound but then i had to print it in a, in a in a print i don't know i don't remember how you call it marry them <laughs> put it in the uh I, it, was, it was it was it was it was lovely i'm proud of it would i do it differently yeah, production wise yes but otherwise i'm happy with it what's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received fake it <laughs> fake the confidence nobody will notice the difference anyways mm, be persistent be persistent there was another horrible sound sentence that I, I and i had to i had to digest when somebody was analyzing this as a first-time filmmaker as a first-time director feature film director you are the biggest enemy the biggest boundary the biggest limitation of the project you yourself because nobody will trust you because you're a first timer you can hire everybody else being more experienced than you you can you can you can have everybody else less risky but you're gonna be always the biggest risk and that sounds horrible but it's true <laughs> What is the worst filmmaking advice you've ever received or heard? Oh my God, I just yesterday, what is it? No, today in the morning, I, I saw this fantastic uh, thread on Instagram. The, the movie memes, do you follow that? Oh my God, I love it. And they started this thread today in comments write your your toxic advice. And everybody was, it's hilarious. It's, it's people are writing like, oh, take your coffee, uh, open the lid and just leave it on the megliner. <laughs> <laughs> people will appreciate you know that kind of stuff it's amazing it's like a hundred comments <laughs> oh, that's wonderful I think it's mo movie set memes or, or what is it called I love it they, they have a lot of uh, advice like that whenever people try to tell you to do something in a different way that is not you you will always regret it because even if it's not even if it doesn't work at least you can you know I don't want to say you can blame yourself because we are not, we're not supposed to be blaming here, but you can take responsibility. But when you follow somebody's advice and you kind of have a bad gut feeling about it, but you follow it anyways, and then you don't like it, then what? It's horrible. And you haven't learned. Do you have a goal as a filmmaker? Like a house in Bali or winning the Oscar or... <laughs> 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 All good answers. <laughs> I want to make films with amazing, crazy people with a content that helps at least a few people who watch the film or where, where they can feel a little, little bit better about themselves. If you could go back in time, what's the piece of advice you'd give yourself? About filmmaking. About anything. Be brave. Be bold. It's better if you, if you are brave and bold. 
in, in my opinion, that's what I see uh, around those filmmakers who dare to make bolder, braver decisions. They, they make a bigger splash somehow. They, I mean, I think those who try to compromise and play the game, and which I do a lot of times, I'm not sure if that's the best way to go. Mm. I think sometimes it's better if, like probably all the time, it's better if you were just like, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> And last question, is making movies hard? Terribly hard. <laughs> Crazy hard. It's it's un undescribable. It's it's unbelievable. Like you would you would you would never I nobody can nobody can prepare for you for that for this. You really like like there are days where you're like really like I see myself on set and I'm probably looking like John Travolta in pulp fiction. Like what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> but but uh, I still think that this is the best job ever. Mm, no, I, now you know it's also it must be very cool to be a rock and roll star <laughs> or a conductor of a of a classical or orchestra. That must be also very cool. <laughs> I like your comparisons: director, <laughs> rock star, classical composer. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> But I, I think a director is kind of all of it. I mean, you have to be, you have to be, sometimes I feel like I'm a kindergarten nurse. I know this was a wonderful performance. <laughs> sometimes you have to be a, a dictator, like hardcore, like ruthless. For example, when you have to fire someone, which is horrible, but if it's good for the film, then you have to do it. So yeah, that, that, that somebody said that it's, it's such a good, uh, smart thing to say. In this industry, you have to grow a really thick skin to survive the industry. But on the other hand, you have to have the softest skin because you have to say, stay sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, an, that's, that's an oxymoron. That's a paradox. How? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But I guess we, we learned it along the way. We should ask Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Marty, our best friend, Marty. <laughs> we are we're at time so i think we just have to cap it off right now but i just wanted to briefly say thank you very very much because this has been a wonderful yeah. interview no oh, thank you you have great questions thank you very much do you love making movies as hard and you want to listen to more episodes jump over to our patreon page at patreon.com slash mmih and you can listen to the entire back catalog of episodes for just 199 a month that's an additional 300 episodes that aren't on iTunes that you can listen to whenever you please. But without any more blibber blabber. Back to the show. Auric, what do you remember about our talk with Orshi? I remember that Orshi was very calculated and very clear in her decision making of how she approached things. I loved hearing her story of how she met Dean Devlin and like what that relationship was like and how when she first met him, there was like none of this like, oh, I'm nervous or whatever. It was just like her boss on the show she was shooting. So it was like she just treated him like she treats any other producer or crew member or whatever, you know, and just whatever, which I thought was like a really good advice and really good, like just, you know, just whoever they are, like just they're, they're, you're working with them. So you don't, you don't need to go crazy or anything. Cause if I met Dean Devlin and I was directing a TV show and he gave me notes, I would be like, Oh, Mr. Independence Day, whatever you say, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Of course, sir. Of course, whatever you want. But it seems like she was just more whatever, just not made a big deal out of it, which I think was smart and good that you don't stress yourself out over meeting people that you admire, you know? And then when she got into the whole thing of actually like negotiating to, to direct the movie and like her approaching that, I think it's just a classic thing that you hear every time anyone has a really great story like this. It's like they get an opportunity and they meet it head on, right? Like they don't just say, well, I've got this thing or, or like, oh, it'll never happen. So why bother, you know, putting together this or that? You know, it's, it's just like she got this opportunity and she killed it. Like she like did the research. Like she came up with a concept. She read the script. She built a deck. She really like came prepared, ready to answer any and all questions and, and just really advocate for the story that she saw in this script, you know, and like what she could do if she were to able to, and she like basically just like, Boom, like put it all out there, you know, basically thinking that it probably wouldn't happen. And then of course it does, but she like treated it like it was a real thing. And, and I also like that when she said that she didn't take the first offer, like even when it's Dean Devlin, you don't take the first offer. I thought that was really cool. Cause I think if I got that kind of dream job, I'd be like, yeah, whatever you say. 
you want to pay me 50 cents? I'll be there. Just pay a cover for my, uh, my travel. But like the fact that she negotiated in that really fortuitous situation, I think is really cool. But I don't know. What about you, Liz? What do you remember? Yeah, I, that is all, they're all, so they're all, those are all really good points. I was struck by travel in Europe is like travel in the United States to a filmmaker. Like if you're a European filmmaker and you're like, oh, I'm in, I don't know, right? she's, I know she's based often in London, but she's Hungarian. But, you know, and they're like, oh, we're just going to hop, skip and a jump to London and they'll hop, skip and a jump to Serbia. It just, it's just so funny to me that these like vastly different communities and cultures are just like an informal part of the travel of a production. Whereas for if you're a US based filmmaker, it's like, okay, well, you go to Kentucky, you go to Atlanta, you go to, you know, maybe Toronto, (laughs) maybe Vancouver, but it's not like Serbia, which is just so different from England, right? It's just so, it blows my mind to a degree that you can, the, the opportunity for perspective and growth and travel for an international filmmaker, it's just crazy to me. Other than that, yeah, I loved what she said about how she didn't have time to be anxious, but also she doesn't really strike me as a, a, like a like a super anxious person. Like she really did seem like someone who was confident, held her own. And I think we've talked about it before, but when you think you're not going to get something or when you're not acting desperate or when you're, you know, you're, you're kind of the last thing on your mind is getting the job and you're just being yourself and working hard. That seems to be the fertile ground where, where the job does come to you in actuality. And it seems like that was the situation for her. Yeah. Amazing. I think everyone should listen to this episode because it's just such a cool, it's just a cool story. And it's just like a really great example of like being ready to make your, your, your dream come true. I guess in in a way, <laughs> you know, just being, be prepared, have everything ready to go. And then boom, you know, if you get a chance, it might just work out. And if it didn't work out, that would have been fine too, probably. But like, it's just kind of amazing that you got to make this movie in, in these crazy circumstances, but like with, you know, probably more resources <laughs> than either of us have ever made a movie on before. And also to get hired to do it. Another, just amazing. Okay, Liz, it's time. It is time for the game. So this week, we have a, a listener submitted a question from Colin Stryker, who already sent in a question before, which was lovely. But he sent in another one. A little, little bit of background to this. So the question was submitted to Eric. Eric had a couple suggestions of notes because cause he just well, he wasn't he was concerned it was too easy. And then he, he gave the notes and then I got given both. But I think I want to read Colin's original question first. Because I think it's really interesting the way that he phrased it. And then I like Eric's additions too. I think they're great. But I really want to know, like, will, I don't know if your answer will change. And I want to know if it would. So I'm going to just answer the the original question and then we'll see how that goes. And then maybe I'll speak a little bit and then I'll ask, I'll add the other bits. Okay, here we go. So, oh, and just for people who don't know what the game is, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's a situation (laughs) where this is a game that we play every week now because we just love it where uh, Eric or a listener provides like a scenario, like an indie filmmaking scenario and and makes us decide like what we will do in that scenario. Like if we were faced with this problem on on one of our sets, how would we solve this problem? So it's something that Eric's been doing for, you know, gosh, a few months now, I think. And they're great. And we've had a couple of listeners submitted questions and this is the third one, second by Colin. So here we go. Here is the question. And Liz hasn't seen this yet. I've only seen it and Eric. So Liz hasn't seen this. You've just wrapped production. Hooray. The final day of your shoot was actually the first scene of your horror film. A big set piece that sets the tone with some awesome horror supplemented by expensive visual effects. In the script, this first scene is followed by a first act of slow burn character development. The first scene isn't strictly necessary for the plot, but your hope was for it to rope people in from the get-go and make the film more appealing for distribution. In a horrible quirk of a technical failure, you discover the sound recorded for your final day is completely lost. There was lots of dialogue, but it's all gone and all you have is video. Bringing everyone back to reshoot is going to be prohibitively expensive. Do you A. Wait out the six months, get more money, and reshoot. B, ADR all the dialogue. C, ditch the scene completely. Or D, other. Director, what do you do? What do you do? 
Oh, okay. So I'm stuck between D, other, and B, ADR, because we don't know what the scene is, right? So it's a very, it's, it's a hypothetical question. But I do agree that, you know, we heard from Zach Hirsch, and I think it's just general knowledge that if you're making a horror film, you want to have a kill early on, if you want to, you know, have a chance at the traditional marketplace. I like to always couch it with the fact that if you're going with traditional distribution. So I agree that you need some sort of cold open esque type kill. It feels appropriate in the horror film world. It might not have to be this one. And if it's not particularly tied to the plot, why not rewrite a new kill scene with one actor in a location that you could have access to with no dialogue that you can shoot as part of your pickups? So like that would be my instinct. But I think B of... ADR, it's like, well, if you have a really good sound team, like, and you build a sound... I mean, we ADR'd things for Speed of Life where it matched perfectly and it was beautiful. And I know you can always tell a little bit, but... Maybe there's a way you could cut the scene where you can cut as much of the dialogue out as possible. You're always in a wide or I don't know. There are other solutions. But my instinct is to reshoot not the scene that you originally shot, but to to write something new within your resources that involves a kill. Auric, what were you thinking? So I'm just... I think that opening scenes of a movie that are supposed to be exciting and, and set up the pace and like have a kill or whatever, that the best versions of those don't have dialogue. Like, I don't think a dialogue heavy mm. opening kill scene is a good call. I think that's a bad call. So I would wonder <laughs> if just not having the dialogue in the, in the scene would be fine and either, you know, coming up with a creative way where you can't hear what they're saying. And that's like part of the dis- construction yeah. of the scene or the edit where you're like, Oh, like, you know, you're kind of like being mysterious and setting this up and then suddenly somebody gets the axe in the back or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> I think that would be really intriguing or like what I do with 90% of all my movies, I cut like 50% of the dialogue out of the scenes anyways. So like I would just edit the movie in a way where not having audio wasn't a problem and that you're just really focusing on the visual storytelling for the opening scene to like really bring you into the story through that and then to like really surprise the crap out of you with a lot of blood or whatever this really expensive practical effect thing is that's going to be super cool like make that the hero of the moment and fuck the dialogue yeah. no one needs dialogue that's yeah. bullshit you know not to say that there aren't good opening scenes with dialogue in them of course but like I just don't think that that's like what you should be worrying about or like focusing that is like the most important part of the scene I think the dialogue is secondary to like the mood the tone the action the special effect like that's what really matters in this opening scene yeah it's like what if i forgot about the kill i forgot that there already is this vfx heavy kill but what if it's just the kill right what if it's like the title yeah. sequence is just the kill hell and yeah it's like you get to it right immediately i love that idea i think you and i, I are would the watch same that page. movie that would be yeah. super exciting if you're just watching a, a kill happen or the just the effect and that yeah. is the opening sequence of the movie. That's super in- engaging because yeah. you have all this mystery. Like, what is happening? What's going to happen there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you want to yeah. hear Eric's addition yes. to this question? So do, Eric yeah. tagged on, which I think is really funny and, and slightly terrifying. To make things worse, <laughs> your lead actor has passed away in a tragic car accident. So you will not be able to use their <laughs> voice. Your producer tells you that they can raise more funds, but it'll take up to six months. I said, God damn, Eric, coming with the fucking Wait. darkness, sir. Wait, can we bring in even more context? Because I think the idea is that Eric thought the first question was too easy and he wanted yeah. to make it harder, right? right? But I don't think the first question is like th- the obvious answer is an ADR. So no. Eric, Eric's taking ADR off the table, right? Uh, with uh, this his, embellishment. His, his addition is and bring in an impressionist to try to match the lead actor's <laughs> voice. <laughs> well, I mean, I it could happen. I just think that's so funny that Eric is like just just really giving it to this production, just really making it hard for them. Like, yeah. and then it's this horrible easy. thing happens. Here's a big tragedy just to ruin your lives, filmmakers. Here you go. <laughs> right? I mean, I I think our co co answer still stands for me. It's yeah. like make that make it into a really cool title sequence, or make it a mystery, but focus on the kill. 
take away not uh, the dialogue unless you're doing some sort of like Tarantino-esque clever look at me I have to have this dialogue because it sets up who I am as a writer director in some way then if not just cut it out I think if you're if that's your intention of the scene you should rethink your intention of the scene (laughs) (laughs) that's not good storytelling that's just self self awareness like there's only a few people in the world of filmmaking who can successfully write scenes like that and make them actually entertaining and good, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and those people can't do it all the time either. Like th- they don't always succeed at that. So, so I think like, yeah, I have whatever people say, it's like Tarantino. It's like this. It's like, mm, maybe you just have less words. Just <laughs> can you cut the words out there. That would be better. It's just half the words. Then the scene's great. <laughs> This was a fun one. Thank you so much, Colin, for for the question. And and Eric, thank you for trying to up the ante on difficulty. <laughs> Although I feel like it was a really good example that like it it was it was a good question by itself because you know it, the answers didn't change with the added level of difficulty. You know, like it was still yeah. the same answer, the same response. And my my I, I guess that's what it was gonna be. You know. Although I do, I think Eric's addition is very fun. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, and I, I wonder, I'm actually curious, like, cause you, you and I both thought the same way, but I wonder if other filmmakers would think differently. Like, would, would, you, right. would your first instinct be, oh no, we have to ADR this? Is that what, you know, I, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if that's like another, you know, we got 10 filmmakers in the room. Would it be like 50 yeah. 50 or would it be like, you know, overly one way or the other? Like, are we the anomalies here? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just curious, like, what people think. I'm going to retract my my option of B entirely of ADRing because now I'm just thinking if it's dialogue heavy and you're keeping the dialogue, then the dialogue's really important. Then it's really going to be noticeable that it's all ADR'd. Like, it's just going to take people out <laughs> it's even of the worse, viewing right? experience. Yeah. It's worse. Yeah. So now I'm really like, I'm taking that one off the table entirely. I think you re- you shoot something new or you adjust the opening sequence yeah. to just do the kill. I like that. That's cool. Yeah, that's a good point. That, but I mean, you know, you look at some famous movies like like the spaghetti westerns or whatever those are all adr'd you know and like you just kind of get used to it and whatever you know? right but we're yeah. in america we're not making this in, <laughs> in italy we're, we're in america <laughs> good point all right well if you want to be like colin and send us a game question you could do so and also send lots of other questions or comments or suggestions whatever you'd like to podcast at mickeymoviesishard.com or if you really like the show you can leave us a review on itunes which would be amazing Uh, you can also check us out on facebook instagram and twitter at mmih podcast and youtube at mickey movies is hard podcast you should also check out the international screenwriters association the isa they're an organization designed to connect writers with filmmakers through a number of programs they offer including publishing your logline to a network of industry professionals, consultation courses, contests, and of course their top 25 writers, writers list. So head over to www.networkisa.org to sign up for free today. Thanks to Orshi Negapal for coming on the show. Thanks to Dina Dore from J. Goldstein PR for setting this up. Thanks to our editor Jeff Vrymoot for doing the editing. And thanks to our producer Eric Toms for simply being awesome. Thanks to you all for listening and we'll talk to y'all next week.